Hey everyone, I'm Chris Price from Facebook and thanks for watching Accelerating AR. In this new video series, we're talking with creative agencies from all over the world who are successfully using Spark AR to build and grow their business. So let's get started. Our guest today is Shervant Aluru. He's the founder and CEO of Avatar Me. Shervant, welcome. Thanks, Chris. It's, it's all my pleasure to be here with you. Shervant, for people watching who might be less familiar with Avatar Me, can you please give us a quick introduction? Sure, Chris. Um, maybe I'll start with me. I, I started my computer vision journey two decades back at Microsoft. If you remember those multiplayer tennis games on Xbox, we used to do 3D reconstruction with a device called Kinect on top of it. Uh, did my B school in, in, at Wharton and, and then spent six years as a test tech investment banker before starting Avatar. Avatar, um, you know, is, is a deep tech AI startup focused on trying to bring the, the computer vision algorithms with a little bit of uh, AI led scalability and, and automation to it. Um, we today focus primarily on commerce, um, assisting pre purchase commerce discovery of products across a brand and a consumer. And we're proud partners of Facebook and Instagram ecosystems and working with a lot of brands in their attempt to upgrade their 2D video campaigns or products on Facebook and Instagram into life-size experiences that both leave a recall in, in consumers' mind, equally bring better ROI propositions for these marketplaces and brands. That's awesome. So I know we have a few projects that you guys have worked on. Can you show us the first one that you guys are, uh, wanted to show us today? Sure. Um, you know, I'll probably start with Samsung, which is one of the virtual product launches that we did. This was a pre-purchase consumer decision assisting awareness slash consideration campaign done by Samsung. It was a flagship phone that was being launched for the first time. And the idea was to unbox the entire phone in a consumer home for them to be able to look at feature discovery of the product in a far more immersive and rich manner. And, and literally, you know, get a touch and feel aspect of the product, interact with the features of it, look at the 360 degree feel of the product. How does it look in my, in my environment? And then start looking at screen specs, CPU, GPU specs. The context was also gamified in the sense that we brought in a little bit of a gamification to the whole experience. So beyond you being able to look at the product, you could actually start participating in a gamified contest. You, you had to find a couple of puzzles in a, in a mural and, and get to participate in a contest that Samsung was running. Um, interestingly, what we saw was significant UGC as well as conversion rate uplift. Um, you know, Facebook was trying to do a BLS study on this. And, and what we've saw, seen is, is a significant jump in both the number of consumers who go to the next stage of the funnel, which is the CTA built in compared to a 2D video. Equally, we saw a lot, con lot of consumers actually recording their own video with the Samsung phone in their background, talking about it and posting, which drove a lot of word of mouth amplification to the ad paid, you know, paid ad spend that, that the brand was doing. So we, we saw some phenomenal ROI uplifts um, across all segments that you can imagine compared to a 2D video when we did this. That's a really awesome project. When you guys came with gamifying the experience, what made it so unique and different than what you've seen before on the platform? I think the, the power that augmented reality brings is, is context, right? I, in fact, sometimes call it contextual reality because you can start creating, um, you know, rather than 2D videos, which are one way push from a brand to the consumer, a static narrative of 60 seconds, you can actually bring consumers into the experience itself. And, and the, the unique thing that we did here was while it was primarily a product launch and the focus was about trying to sell a product to the consumer, we made them part of the narrative, right? We made them the protagonist of the entire experience, starting from the moment you launch the AR um, a filter on, on Facebook. And in, in the process, what we saw was consumers have a lot more recall and a lot more emotional pull if you can bring in their involvement. And, and I think to your question, Chris, that's where gamification plays a big role. If you can some, if you can kind of make it a pull versus a push consumer psychology, you could even probably do product launches, which are, you know, end of the day, a commerce focused awareness campaign, 
to be a lot more fun, to be a lot higher recall for consumers and probably convert them into word of mouth champions for you as a brand. Um, we see Facebook and Instagram both equally being very powerful platforms today um, in the ability to you know, credit to you guys in terms of how you've kind of democratized AR across all possible consumer touch points in the ecosystem. And, and on top of it, when you add AR for ads, gamification coupled with product discovery tends to be a very unique proposition to anything that you would have probably seen before. We're seeing incrementally more and more brands now thinking about sale events, e-commerce marketplaces thinking about this. Um, and I, I think we'll see a very vibrant, um, you, know, you know, next few, next 12 months in the Facebook and the Instagram ecosystems around commerce and how we can literally create a paradigm shift on visual discovery and commerce with what Facebook and Instagram has to offer. Now, I think you guys did an awesome work on making the person the center of the experience as well as the product. Um, you guys really did tie um, the experience of unboxing it, learning about the specs really into the whole narrative and not feel as much of an ad, which a lot of brands and businesses have been struggling to do, but you guys did a really good job at it. Um, what would you say was one of the most difficult things about building an experience with a physical product that was shareable? That's a good question, um, Chris. I, I think the, the, the complexity comes in at the first level from a technology perspective, which is the photorealism of the product, right? Um, what we've seen is given there's a pre-purchase consumer decision behavior aspect to this experience, it is quite important that you get the product looking as real as the physical product once they order and place it. And so you've got to get the, the rendering right, you've got to get the lighting right, you've got to get the surface look exactly the way a metal or a chrome or a glass would look. Um, so I'd, I'd say that is the technology aspect of the problem, which we go fairly deep into. We today look at 82 parameters of a surface, trying to make sure a glass reflects the way a glass is meant to be, even if it's, mm -hmm. if it's a virtual one. The second aspect I'd say is more behavioral science. Um, it's about, you know, a brand like Samsung is probably looking at aspirational engagement. So to ensure that the entire output of a video that's recorded by a consumer with this experience has to look as aspirational as a brand like Samsung would want to. Um, so you've got to give, give it a lot of um, thought in terms of how do you make the consumer look? How do you make the surroundings look? How do you bring that entire, you know, this is where I believe art meets science in AR. And so you've got to give it the design and the behavioral science aspect as much importance as you would give the science, which is the AI and the computer vision part of it. Uh, it's beautiful. I, I think it's a unique technology in that sense, where you can play both art and science and bring that convergence. Um, so just to give you a sense, our team is equally split between these two today, because we see both being equally important. That's amazing. How did you guys do the research around um, how you guys would expect someone to behave with an experience that was presenting a product in a way that was an unboxing, but also to get them to dive into the specs of it, to also learn about the product? Chris, we, well, we you know, kind of spent five years, a lot of it has been A-B tests. And the best way to really look at, um, you know, behavioral science is data, right? Because you kind of get yeah. 95% of our purchase decision making is subconscious. So we, the, the best way to kind of extract out that wisdom from from data is to have large scale data and, and glad to say that within facebook and uh, instagram ecosystems we are touching about two, 200 250 million of impressions today across such uh, across categories from furniture to large appliances like a refrigerator to you know uh, handheld devices like a like a mobile phone and in the process what we're trying to do is extract understanding of the 90 odd seconds of average engagement time that you tend to get uh, it is significantly higher than a video, so you know, you're probably talking nine ten, times the 10 second average video impression. So you get a lot more richer data, and, and then we're applying behavioral scientists who look at that data at scale, look at it across different demographic cuts, from age demographics to um, consumer segments that, that matter for a, uh, for a typical target audience that the brand is looking for, and be able to then decipher behavioral aspects of these segments. Um, what we've seen, Chris, to your, your point is Gen Z behaves very different. And then there's an early millennial crowd. And then there's, a, you know, the older millennials. And, and these are very different sets of uh, consumer segments, if you will. 
Gen Z is probably a camera generation. They are very comfortable with the camera. You see a lot more recurring, um, you know, pull from their end. The early millennials are probably more um, looking at this from a functional utilitarian perspective as much as a gamification and a fun and an immersion perspective. And the older millennials are probably just saying, what's the utility value in this for me? And, and so you, if, depending on the target audience that a brand wants to target and, and address, you've got to get your positioning right. And so I, I do think that the behavioral science aspect has helped us a lot in being able to help brands, advise them about thinking about everything, starting from content to the consumer journey to the final um, CTA and how do you create that user journey to, towards the goal that the brand's looking for. I think you guys do a really great job at that. So with the product looking as realistic as possible, I know you touched on this, it's really important for the experience. What methods have you guys used to make sure that you guys get the highest quality possible when it comes to displaying of an asset? You, you know, you've got to get into really custom shaders, Chris, so without letting a lot of our secret sauce out, um, you know, the, the idea here is think about it as, as light hitting any surface and then various different light behaviors happening, right? Reflection to refraction to translucency to full transparency. And, and typical real life products would have all four of these happening. And how do you then come up with custom shaders um, which work within an Instagram app, work within a Facebook app and, and run real time when the camera gets launched and, and bring these, these nuances out. I think it's a fairly deep science, I would say. We've spent a lot of, lot of effort working with your product teams, understanding how you think about it, leveraging the shaders capability that I think you've, you've done really well in, in, in creating as a foundation for companies like us to then tap into that, that I'd say um, it's almost a gold mine in terms of the opportunity there is to leverage the shaders and, and do magic when, when camera gets started. Um, a lot of this is actually real time shaders that are happening, um, computer vision algorithms that run when a consumer clicks on an ad and says, open my camera within an Instagram AR for, you know, uh, experience. That's awesome. Great tips there. Let's talk about your next project. The next one is with Flipkart, right? Um, can you tell us more about this one? Yeah, this was very interesting, Chris. Um, we probably pushed the bar in terms of the, the amount of interactivity that you can build in. Now, now, in this particular case, we were launching a Motorola TV and, and the TV was a smart LED TV with a lot of features built in. They had 8D audio capabilities. They had, um, you know, a lot of design specs with respect to the screen or differentiations that the, the brand wanted to promote and, and Flipkart as a marketplace wanted to kind of leverage. So the one, one thing that one boundary that I think we pushed and we did it successfully is bring in a lot more visual storytelling of the product features, right? You will see that you can literally have the audio features being played in and then walk away from the TV and feel the attenuation of depth um, from the distance of the TV to where you're walking. We did a lot of innovation around um, the, the screen specs and how you bring visual storytelling to it. So these are all interactive um, you know, feature clicks that you can do within the camera experience. And so if, if that kind of helps create a pull consumer psychology in the sense that if I'm a consumer who is more interested in the visual aspects, I'll probably go into the screen specs first. So I create my own journey by pulling what I want. If I'm more into the audio features, I'll probably look, the, look at the, the audio feature and, and go in and try to kind of see what is it so special about this product that I haven't seen elsewhere. Um, in the process, I think what we've done is given, a, you know, coupled with, with the partnership that we have with you, um, I, th I think we've been able to create a very unique proposition within Instagram and Facebook where you can bring differentiation of a product and implicitly within an immersive experience so that when a consumer is coming and thinking about this, this brand versus a brand Y versus a brand Z, um, and, and that's their consideration set, how do you make a recall happen when, which differentiates your product versus the other two? products are likely in their, in their mind when they make the purchase decision. So it was a very unique, innovative um, campaign. We, were, we give a lot of credit to the Facebook and the Instagram team. Uh, this is one where we had the entire support of your wherewithal, uh, right from your client partners 
to to, to your um, you know internal um, behavioral scientists, right? So we we leveraged the entire um, wisdom of the Facebook and Instagram ecosystem, and I think we created something very unique that that I believe will take a lot more momentum in in the coming quarters as brands think about differentiating their products in the consumer mind in a far more immersive and in, with a far more higher emotional connect. Um, without rubbing it off as an ad. No, that's awesome. What advice would you guys give to brands or businesses who are trying to differentiate themselves amongst other sort of typical ad formats today who want to go into AR as a format? I'd say um, be open. The you know don't look at the past because the technology is so powerful that it it has the power to create redefine. Um, perhaps a lot of paradigms that that have existed in the two D formats that we've we've seen in the in, in the status quo. Um, one thing that I would I would certainly encourage people to think about is how to beat the innovation boundary because the, the the power of the technology is such that you're now able to manipulate a consumer's physical reality, and there's no end to creativity that you can bring to the table. So, you know, I, I see some amazing creative talent that's beating the boundaries every day. Equally, um, it, from a science perspective, you know, it's literally trying to emulate the laws of physics. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's enough of a one wonderful setup that we see around us, right, in the physical reality. And it's not easy to replicate those laws of physics into a virtual virtual render that, that we, we are trying to do. So I, I would say be, be open, um, leverage, think about this as a new capability altogether where you're helping a consumer manipulate their own physical reality, which is a whole new, whole new paradigm to the historical web 2.0 that, that we've been working on. And I think there's a lot of innovation that's slated in the space um, as, we, as we go forward. And I would love to learn from the new guys who come on and break the boundaries, right? Because I think that takes the industry ahead. I, I think that's good for the ecosystem. I think it's good for everyone. It's a win-win. I'm looking forward to the new folks coming in. I, I really think um, that the space deserves that attention and the space has that potential as, as we look forward. What innovation have you guys seen really influence the way that you guys have been designing in a way that blends people's realities from both the virtual as well as the physical? So the, the power of the spatial depth, right? Um, in fact, just maybe before answering your question, just to get, set the context, 60% of our human sensory perception is visual. And we all perceive our reality with depth in it. And, and so what, what AR literally does is rather than talk about talking about a virtual room that you transported, a portal, for example, or transporting a virtual product or an experience into your reality, I think AR truly brings spatial depth right at its core. Spatial depth to the experience. And, and that's why I'm, I'm personally very excited. I think it's a big jump up to the technology limitations that existed yesterday. Um, and, and with that in, in mind, to your question, it really doesn't matter whether you're transporting someone into a virtual portal, because it still has spatial depth. You can walk around it. You can start interacting in as if you, you have been transported into a virtual environment. Or the other way around, where you, you take, say, a virtual experience and drop it into their own existing physical reality, where you're probably transporting something that's virtual into their true physical reality. In both cases, I think the underlying consumer psychology uh, and the efficacy of this technology remains the same, which is we are bringing depth to their digital visual perception, which never, which was lacking until until AR happened. So um, that that I would say is is the underlying mechanism fuels both sides. So we we've done both both sides of the game to your question. You've done um, a lot of virtual portals where you're taking consumers into brand experiences, brand stores. Um, imagine walking into, say, a, a furniture store with living room concepts and, and bedroom concepts. Equally, we have done the other way around where we're letting furniture, a product, for example, being dropped, being mixed and matched with a, a sofa, a center table and a cabinet being dropped in their, in their own reality for, for the experience to work. So let's switch some gears now. In every interview we do, we try to dig into the business of augmented reality and some of the topics we're often hearing from our Spark creator community. 
Today, I thought we could talk about finding and cultivating AR talent. AR creation is quickly becoming its own career path, and I'd love to hear how you guys have been sourcing and finding and cultivating AR talent today. Given the nascent industry that we're in, um, you know, a lo lot of this is about hiring and training, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll break this down into those two puzzles. Um, you know, I, I think AR in general is very differentiated to the erstwhile technology approach because you have equal potential to, to kind of uh, disrupt on creative paradigms as much as you have to disrupt on machine learning or neural neural overlays on 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 the camera module or equally, you know, just simple advanced physics and math algorithms on the computer vision side. Um, so my way of looking at it is look at it as a, as a great convergence of art and science. And on the art side, I think there are two aspects that, that we look at for hiring. One is the ability to think outside the box because um, this, this technology is quite outside the box and there's so many things that we're probably scratching the surface at this point as an industry. And there's so much more that you, you could do if you were to break the, break the limitations of the, of the constraints that we today assume to be, be existent. On the science piece, I think it's about more physics and math understanding at the base fundamental level, because if you got those fundamentals right, AR is, is something that you can easily build upon. Um, so, you know, we, we don't necessarily look for skills because there's not much skill set out there. Chris, we are probably some of the few early movers in the space. Um, the industry itself has seen penetration in 2019 with the handsets mm -hmm. and the camera penetration going up. So, you know, it's just maybe a one and a half year old PMF industry, if you will. And in the process, therefore, you've got to not only think about hiring, which is, um, which is one part of the equation, but probably give the foundation as a training module um, which allows someone who's a physics or a math en enthusiast to become a, a, a phenomenal AR technologist, or equally for someone who's coming from a 2D design perspective to look at 3D design a whole new way, um, open, open the constraints that depth provides to visual creative acumen and, and you know, kind of train them towards th not thinking 2D, thinking 3D. Um, I think there's a lot of talent. Uh, we haven't struggled, to be honest. Humans are, I'd say, uh, you know, full of talent, right? Um, so it's, it's just about probably creating the right structure, the right process for a human with a potential to be able to reach their own potential. So from Avatar's perspective, we've been trying to make our folks the best versions of themselves um, and, and, and on both sides. Um, so we have a very structured art approach which is creative thinking, and we have a very structured science approach, which is find people who are passionate about physics and math, and then convert them into folks who can, you know, redefine how 3D augmented reality can be brought to life um, in real time. No, that's amazing. And it's, it really does speak to how you guys are taking people who are just passionate about creating content and like repurposing it into an AR space or a VR space. So that's really, really special. And also when you guys are, are looking at people from a math and physics perspective, you guys are getting people with amazing talent from the start and then showing them how they can take their natural ability to understand math and physics and now use it in an AR environment. Um, which really does speak to what you guys have been able to create over the past few years, because all your stuff looks technical, all of it is beautiful. Um, and it really does shine when compared to other people's experiences. So awesome work there. Um, when it comes to um, continuously educating yourself on, on Spark and the industry as a whole, um, how have you kept your talent at Avatar up to speed and continue to get them to innovate and learn and push the limits of what's possible given the current constraints of, of the technology today? I think that here's where I'll give a lot of credit to the ecosystem that you guys have created. Um, very proud to be a Spark partner. Equally, we you know we see a lot of good initiatives that Facebook and Instagram does. Um, for example, the School of Inno In Innovation initiative, which is pretty much a hiring hiring round for us today. Uh, in fact, we probably have double-digit numbers of folks in Avatar today who who were through the School of Innovation that Facebook did. Um, and so, a, a lot of credit to you guys. Uh, we are trying to emulate what you've done, um, perhaps to take it one step ahead once you finish the School of Innovation aspect. 
Um, also, I'd, I'd say the Spark ecosystem is so vibrant today that there's so much collaborative, um, you know, um, upside to being part of this this ecosystem. Right? Uh, you get to learn from the other other um, creators in, in the process. You get to learn a lot from the Facebook wisdom that you guys bring bring to the table. Um, so we we've been honestly as much listeners as we've been value contributors in this. Um, We've emulated what Facebook has done with School of Innovation, which I think is probably, in my view, one of the best initiatives anyone has done uh, globally. In, in, and we're trying to leverage that curriculum, you know, leverage that for even otherwise um, folks that we're hiring from straight colleges and, and, and laterals. The second aspect is just the collaborative nature. We're learning a lot from the rest of the ecosystem within the Spark, um, you know, partnerships. Um, a lot of creators who bring some amazing talent to the table and both in terms of getting inspired from them but equally probably you know uh, learning a lot on on the tricks of the trade um so so I'd, I'd say it's been it's been fairly vibrant i think we should continue that a lot of credit goes to you so sorry i'm not giving you an answer from my side rather probably telling you that you've been doing a great job but i i'm really looking forward to this continuing from your end and, and I think there's a lot of value that you create in the process. Well, thank you for that. Um, I do have a question that may be a little curveball for you. Um, is since you guys have gone through a lot of our training and, and kind of have seen the ecosystem grow over the past few years, what would be one suggestion for us to improve? I'd say the, the one thing that we should certainly think of as, as an industry is, is bringing consumer behavioral sciences into the platform a little bit more, Chris. Um, at this point, the, the, all the effort that we're doing is about either the technology aspect, which is the math physics piece, or the creative aspect, which is the content creation piece. But we haven't yet, I think we're still scratching the surface on understanding consumer psychology and being able to decipher that out and, and leverage it as, as a group. Um, I don't see too much of a focus yet on it. Again, early days, so data is also early, so I can understand why we are where we are. But as, as a group, we all the onus is on us, um, Avatar as much as on Facebook, as much as on the entire Spark ecosystem, for all of us to start thinking, how do we take this to the next level post the novelty aspect of the technology ways out, right? Um, how do you think yeah. about fatigue factors? How do you think about, how do we make this a, a paradigm shift forever, rather than a good to have you know, um, experience that everyone's in there for fun. I think that'll be an important aspect for all of us to focus and something that I'd appreciate if you guys also focus as much as we should. No, totally. That's, that's a really great suggestion. And we'll definitely take it in, into consideration as we build out more programs. What are some of your thoughts on subcontracting versus staffing for AR projects? I think um, at, at this point, subcontracting is, is something that you can do that, that just helps the overall industry. Having said that, you've got to be very careful about it because quality does matter. Um, you know, a lot of brands are first time, first time uh, advertisers or leveraging AR. And, and so, you know, it's it, with that power of being their partner comes the responsibility of making sure that they actually succeed. And, and so at this point, I would say, Quality is probably higher importance than the execution process. And, and what we've kind of seen is um, you've got to draw the balance. You can you can certainly outsource some of the basic stuff, but you've got to keep the handle on ensuring the, the ROI proposition that you as a partner to the brand are able to deliver, and which is where subcontracting may, may not work that well. Um, so there are bits and pieces where I think subcontracting works. We are, we are probably open to it as ourselves. Having said that, the certain aspects where I think it's too early for us to to leave control um, as a company. Oh, that's amazing. What advice can you give other agencies for how to mature and grow their a AR expertise and talent? I think the first thing I would say is passion. Make sure you have enough passion. The rest of it seems to follow. Um, make sure that you're well connected in the Facebook ecosystem. There's a wealth of wisdom in, in this partnership, make sure that you leverage that wealth and, and, and not have to reinvent the wheel um, and rather you leverage the existing wisdom that 
I think is phenomenal in this ecosystem. Um, the third I would say is think big, uh, you know, just keep breaking boundaries. Don't, don't restrict yourself to the here and now daily needs of a client. Keep, keep thinking big, keep thinking outside the box. Um, the technology has a lot of potential, which will only come to forth if all of us do that. And, and so the, I, I would, I really look forward to some amazing work outside of Avatar because I, I think that is what's going to take the industry um, forward. And, and I do think that, that it is important that these new agencies keep a few of these principles in mind as they try to scale up. Shravna, how are you guys hiring people and are there any internal events, um, methods you guys are using to help you cultivate great talent that are coming in straight through the door? Yep, because, um, you know, I, th I think it's, um, given the nascent industry, you've got to be a little bit more creative. Um, you may not get people that have existing skills all the time, but you may be missing out on some really talented folks who literally are meant to be great leaders in the space, right? Um, and so the way we've kind of thought about it is to make it more fun, make it a bit more competitive, bring the, bring the mojo out of folks that may not be so deep into the technology already, but give them a little bit of flavor of what it is. Um, and so we've been leveraging internally, at least our hiring process and, and has been leveraging hackathons. We do weekend sprints. We will literally invite any AR enthusiast outside of Avatar uh, to come in or uh, take part in a, in say a competitive race between various groups that we form. You'll most likely be with four other strangers um, because we, we tend to create those pods, if you will. And so you, you're learning from four other people, you're getting diverse opinions, equally you're actually working as a team towards an outcome that, that is finally an AR experience that, that excites you and, and gives you the satisfaction. So we've been seeing that to be a very successful format. Um, both weekend sprints work well, offline hackathons work well. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is campus programs. I think it's very important that we go in a little early. Um, you know, in the sense that there's a lot of enthusiasm in today's Gen Z, you know, audience on, on this, not just as a consumer, but equally as someone who looks at it as a career. Um, some of it is just purely exposure not being there. So what we're trying to do at Avatar is, is literally create that exposure across campus programs. So we're signing up with campuses um, across different universities creating these opportunities in your, say, uh, say final year for you to be participating in, in various different initiatives or uh, some being paid and, and in the process, get a taste of the, of, of this domain and figure out if, if that's what you want to be looking at as a career. And we're seeing a lot of success in it. We see about 60, 70% success rates of everyone from campuses who come in just in an exploratory mode ending up being a strong AR enthusiast who's then probably just joining us full time at the end of their, their um, university. So I, I think that's, that's the other thing that we've seen a lot of success in. Oh, that's amazing. You guys have been really exciting people from like day one and getting them in the door and then keeping them motivated to continue to create, which is amazing. Um, and it really does speak to the talent that is at your company. Shravant, what would be three key takeaways that you would give an early agency or an individual creator trying to get other people on board with them to create um, and kind of build up their own kind of talent pool to kind of start taking on more work and as, as well as producing great work with their peers? Sure, Chris. Um, the first, I think, is, is passion and energy, right? Um, that seems to somehow reflect in the quality of work that you do. So. I do think that um, keep the passion high, keep the energy high, keep keep ensuring that the team is realizing that they're probably breaking the boundaries that, that have existed for decades now in terms of how 2D formats were limited to how life-size 3D and spatial depth can really change the experiences. Um, the second I would say is, is probably at some level thinking outside the box, so think big. Um, I, I do think that there's ability of creative going beyond the current constraints with the 2D formats, equally the science and then the, and the behavioral sciences analytics aspect of it going beyond what exists today. So the onus is on all of us in, and including, and I'm, I'm sure that there'll be new 
folks coming in with perspectives that will further take the industry ahead. I, I would certainly keep that aspect in mind. The third is, is just purely having the, the merge of art and science is going to be important in augmented reality because it is finally a visual domain. And, and so when you're thinking about creating a new company, keep a perspective on both, give it equal importance. Don't, don't forget one over the other or prioritize one over the other. Um, in, 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 in the confluence of these two is where magic happens. Um, that, those would be my advice, Chris, from an outside in perspective for someone who's starting new. Shervant, thanks again for joining us today. It's been great having you with us. Where can people learn more about Avatar Me and see more of your team's work? Well, you can visit our website. It's avatar.me. It's A-V-A-T-A-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-